Okay, we're rolling. Um, so we've we've covered mushroom use for bioremediation and for human health. Of course, eating it is already uh, supporting human health. But which particular mushrooms would you um, recommend to to grow for local food security? Um, you mentioned something about vitamin D and mushrooms, which would be in interesting to hear a little bit more about and um, the whole protein content of mushroom story is, is quite interesting. Well first let me go back to we just had dinner the other night yeah. and we had a, it's a we had a vegetarian dinner and we had chanterelles thank you Alice <laughs> and, and pasta yeah. and the chanterelles have about 15 percent protein it's a wild mushroom when the mushrooms are in season we're out collecting them but the mushrooms we collect in the season then we can grow many of them all year round so nature is the source of all strains so Wild collecting mushrooms gives you a great source, complete amino acid complexes, rich in vitamin Bs, and they're all mushrooms, cultivated or wild, that we've tested so far, hyper-produced vitamin, pro-vitamin D2. And um, the mushrooms go from very low vitamin D contents of what's about f um, 40 to 50 IUs of vitamin D. Um, one IU is, is, I think, 40 micrograms. And the mushrooms go from you know, 40 or 50 IUs of vitamin D when they're picked in October or so and they're not exposed to direct sunlight. But if you put the mushrooms out, even dried from the previous year, into the sun, the full sun for two days, the vitamin D goes from 50 IUs of vitamin D to more than 40,000 per 100 grams. It skyrockets. Vitamin D is an essential uh, uh, vitamin and nutrient for your immune system. At, uh, at Harvard, um, uh, medical school, the university associated with it, they did a clinical study retroactively looking at recovery from lung cancer using conventional therapy. Lung cancer recovery is very, very low. And they found there was a fourfold increase in lung cancer recovery when the conventional treatments were given in the summertime versus the wintertime. The only cofactor was vitamin D. So whatever strategy you have for improving human health, the absence of vitamin D lessens that ability for you to benefit from it. So the hyperproduction of vitamin D in mushrooms gives you more vitamin D than any land-based organism. So it's very important that people very know that. Very important for people in the UK because in the UK. most people in the UK are vitamin D deficient because we don't have enough sunlight. And um, a person I just met has just submitted a paper and he compared uh, mushroom vitamin D from vitamin D in capsules and looking at the absorption of vitamin D in the serum and the blood and found a direct parallel path dose response parallel to actually taking a prescribed dose of vitamin D and the vitamin D that ended up in the blood uh, mimicked that of the vitamin D uh, whether from the mushrooms or from the capsules. So I think he's gone a long way in proving that this actually has a benefit in the serum mm -hmm. and de facto that would benefit your immune system. And um, in terms of food production in local areas, people are beginning to be concerned about food security issues. Um, there is no greater yielding plant that I know growing on, or, or food source growing on land, aquatic systems aside, because they're a different ecosystem, uh, than growing mushrooms on straw, for instance. One ton of straw, 2,000 pounds, can grow about 400 pounds of dried mushrooms. Which so you can get about a 25% conversion mm -hmm. of a cellulosic substrate that has less than a half a percent nitrogen to a mushroom which has up to 20% nitrogen. There is a nitrogen deficit when you do this formulas, and it's been a conundrum for mycologists for a long time, and that you end up with more nitrogen at the end of the process, net weight, than you do at the beginning. But we think that's coming from nitrogen-fixing bacteria, which is then the mycelium up channels and uses in building the mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that, a ton of straw, you can't eat any of that straw. You know, in two to four weeks, you can have hundreds of pounds of mushrooms that can feed hundreds of people, a quarter pound of mushroom per person. You do the math. You can feed a thousand people, you know, several meals from one ton of straw. So it's very intensive, it's very fast, and moreover, that straw then becomes a mulch that can eat nematodes, and oyster mushrooms are well known to producing a little lasso that uh, nematodes, for whatever reason, go through the lasso and, <laughs> and it cinches them, and it consumes nematodes as a food source. So nematodes uh, hurting root crops is a big issue. Mm -hmm. Oyster mushrooms mulching after you pick the mushrooms, or during when you pick the mushrooms, benefits the ecosystem in reducing 
other parasitic organisms that can impair other vegetables. And so, so oyster mushrooms, shiitake, is what, what else? Oyster mushrooms, shiitake, maitake, enoki take, bunahan shimeji. Um, there's about 50 to 100 species that we can cultivate right now, only based on. Now, some people, I, we, the number actually is higher than that, but commonly cultivated, there's less than 50 species. Uh, we could be having hundreds of species. Some of these grow in snow layers, some of these grow in the hottest tropics. So we have a repertoire of species to choose within our library of candidates that can span all seasons. So this is all in, in your book Mycelium Running, but you um, also wrote a bigger book that is specifically about mushroom cultivation for food and medicine. There's two other books, The Mushroom Cultivator and Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms, combine this 1,100 pages of intensive information on substrate preparation and sterile tissue culture technique. Mycelium Running was my attempt to try to go away from the laboratory and to gain mush mushrooms in natural systems. Um, even though the intensive cultivation with sterile tissue culture is really largely perfected and high guarantee of success, what the, the mushroom mycelium grown in the laboratory does not have, the mushroom mycelium grows in, in natural environments, is an intact immune system. It's the baby in the bubble syndrome. So under clean room conditions, clean environments, we can grow lots of mushrooms. But when you take the mushroom mycelium out of the laboratory and you throw it in the ground, you feed a bunch of bugs. They gobble it up. And so what mycelium running does talks a lot about the transitional state of familiarizing and acquainting the immune system of fungi with a natural microflora so they're able to withstand uh, being put out into nature. When you when you were at Fintod, you explained to the nice. gardeners how to um, transplant stem buds from um, parasol mushrooms so you could actually spread your crop of parasol mushrooms. Could you explain that briefly? It's not fair. It's, not it's fair. just not fair. <laughs> then 35 years developing sterile tissue culture techniques, and then this technique is so simple. It's taken, and and I think it's, I think you know again we should go back to nature because this is a good example of why this works. Many of the stem butts when we collect the mushroom in the wild, if you're a bear or a deer mm -hmm. or a person, you trim off the stem butt because it's got dirt, and you want to eat the mushroom without dirt. So we pick the mushrooms, we take a few steps, we trim off the stem butt, we throw it on the ground. It turns out those stem butts regrow with an enormous vigor. Totally unexpected. The caps won't do that. The caps will rot. But the stem butts, the big butt of stem becomes mycelium. And so you can put that onto cardboard and create sheet mulch. And the good thing about that mycelium coming from stem butts, it has an immune system. It's already intact with the microbes. And so it already has defenses against the para microbial parasites that it's in contact with. Then you grow sheets of mycelium out on wet cardboard, corrugated cardboard, and the mycelium grows really quickly down the corrugations. Then you can put wood chips on top of that, and then you end up with a mycelial membrane, a mother patch. And then this mother patch can be put out in along trails, and you end up with veins. And the cool thing about mycelium is it follows the path oftentimes of human footsteps, because as we build trails in the woods and we break sticks underneath, the mycelium senses that newly available nutrition, so it surges. So a lot of these fungi have actually been following human activity for thousands of years. And so the wood chip loving mushrooms, including the psilocybe, the psilocybin mushrooms, are really localized on the debris fields of humans. And it's interesting that even those species could have very strong bioremediative properties but because of their illegality and the irrational fear, you know, of them being abused, um, irrational in some cases, irrational in others, it's, they, those species are not in the limelight. But we found that group to be especially active in breaking down VX, which Saddam Hussein did use against the Kurds, mm -hmm. and those mushrooms produce an enzyme that dephosphorylates dimethylmethylphosphonate, DMMP, which is the core constituent nerve toxin in VX. So specifically so, psilocybin mushrooms? Specifically uh, psilocybin mushrooms mm -hmm. did that. Um, but here's an example where if we have a mushroom that's illegal that would have a tremendously positive effect that prevents bioterrorism, what side of the fence are you going to be on? You know, it becomes a complicated endeavor. One of the biggest challenges that we face is that you mentioned mushrooms, people make fun of you. And so I put it to you, what politician will stick their neck out saying we should invest in mushroom technologies to, to help fight bioterrorism? Well, actually, the U.S. Defense Department it's cool that they actually see that as being very plausible and medical practitioners, doctors who are in the knowledge of diseases 
you know, uh, disease pathogens in particular, they get it. Mushrooms don't like the rot. They pr produce a host defense of immunity against microbes until they sporulate. And after they sporulate, they rot. But up to that point in time, they, they forestall many of the same microbial diseases that afflict us. But you come to a politician and the, who has a political career, and who's in charge of budgets, governments, and policy, you know, good luck, because the politicians do not want to be made fun of. And if they have an adversary who's anti-nature, you know, anti-environmentalist, then they could use them as a target. And so that's why I think this is another problem, that we may have the very solutions that save us from extinction, but because of you know, the politics of, of, uh, being, uh, of, of being made fun of, we might end up falling off the face of this planet, so to speak, ecologically, just because we don't want to look bad. We don't want to be embarrassed. That would be a true irony of human existence. And it may be that we are condemned to, to that fate. I don't know. I've got this one thing that came up just because of the... Maybe to ask a question around the, the Iceman and linking it to um, the whole long-term history of um, humanity's co-evolution with mushrooms, and, but it's even older than 2,000 years. Um, are you still running?